And so, Dennis, what is the Good Behavior Game? How did it start? Take it from here. Well, the Good Behavior Game, or Pax Good Behavior Game, is what we call it presently in school, in the practice of schools, is a very simple intervention which was originally first invented and published in 1969 by a fourth grade teacher who had a classroom from hell. And how the game basically works is that it creates sort of inter uh, interdependent contingencies for teams to work together to create a transcendent goal that would be reinforcing for all. And so, you know, a lot of us have some experience with transcendent goals. You know, if you went to university and you were cheering for your sports team, you know, you're participating in, a, in essentially something, a group activity, trying to do something important. And a long time ago, there was a, a study uh, called, the Ro uh, called the Robber's Cave Experiment by Mustaf Sharif, in which fifth grade boys uh, were pulled out of uh, classrooms in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They were all rather middle class kids. And as they got off the buses at Robber's Cave, State Park, they were given t-shirts, orange or blue, and they said respectively the Rattlers or the Eagles. And it took about less than 24 hours with those two teams if they didn't have a transcendent goal to be at war. And eventually they were brought back to be a group by having a transcendent goal of having to work together to get the quote broken food truck with the water up the hill to the canteen so everybody could eat and then everybody became friends. So the Pax Good Behavior game is about creating Pax, which the children learn and they define as something that means peace, productivity, health, and happiness. Happiness, And those are fundamental values that most of us uh, have in life as humans. And inside of this game are four separate features coming out of our nurturing environments thinking. One is about increasing psychological safety and flexibility. So if I've got any of my friends and colleagues who are involved with Steve Hayes and acceptance and commitment therapy, give us a round of applause for Steve's thinking. This is a relational frame. We're creating a vision. We're also adopting an identity of being a PAX leader. And that's also a sort of Rosenthal or Pygmalion effect of a child rising to something uh, that is higher than what he or she is presently doing, and then giving nonverbal cues in service of that, and then asking children to predict, self-monitor, and reflect on their movement toward this transcendent goal of PAX. We're also providing rich reinforcement for pro-social behaviors through a bunch of mechanisms, written positive notes that we call tootle notes, or the opposite of tattles or packet notes are similar, but they're for older kids. And then having meaningful roles inside of the implementation. And then we have something very cleverly called Granny's Wacky Prize. So if I have any behavior analysts online, they will recognize this as the PREMAC principle or grandmother's law. So uh, when you eat your uh, dinner, you may have your dessert. So you make something that is an uh, uh, an unpreferred behavior, to have access to that on a least preferred behavior. So the kids paying attention and working hard in the classroom now gives them access to be silly and disruptive and silly, uh, and just doing all the kids the things that kids would do. And then we're also increasing some other can, uh, kinds of things. We're limiting uh, toxic influences. Most people will be familiar with that, with the notion of adverse childhood experiences, and then limiting problematic behaviors through a variety of evidence-based kernels. If some of you have read the work uh, by Anthony Biglin and I on evidence-based kernels, they are the smallest scientifically proven unit of behavioral influence. I'm going to take it off this full screen for a moment. Now, what I want to show you next is, in order to make this game, the teams work, they have to create a vision of where they want to go. If you work in schools today, you'll find that many children, particularly if they come from adverse experiences, poor neighborhoods, really don't have a sense of future. And so we ask the children to imagine that they are 
at the most wonderful school, the most wonderful classroom, the most wonderful school and classroom maybe in my state, Arizona, or if the children are in New York City, we were just talking to people in New York, in New York City, in the state of New York, maybe in all of America, maybe in the whole world, what would you see, hear, feel, and do more of? So this is a list from third graders in doing that activity. The vision. Well, if I could just uh, break in for a second. You started out talking about the game in adult terms, scientific terms, right. but this is how it's presented to young children, in this case, third graders. Exactly. And so there is an adult language and then there's a kid language. And this is driven by the children. Um, this is a sort of weird disclosure, but I may be the only person in the history of the planet who's worked for both Sesame Street and the former Secretary of Defense, Richard Cheney. That's a long story. Um, but one of the things that I learned from the very earliest work in my dissertation work is always making children the heroes of the change, or making whomever you're working with the heroes of the change. So here now, the children are the heroes of the change. And this is the beginning of the Pygmalion effect and the relational frame. So we're asking the kids to imagine what they would see, hear, feel, and do more of in this wonderful classroom. And so they say things like we'd see more funny things, more playtime, more happiness more homework doing, done, good reactions and work. They like uh, work activity games in their academics. They want challenging math. They want to see more kindness and smiles. And they want to see appropriate clothes. Now, you can see there's a mix of things that are very kid-friendly, and some may have been influenced by adult talk. Then they want to hear more laughter. They want to um, uh, hear more nice and kind words and good comments to their teams and uh, classmates. They want to hear people asking to be friends. They want uh, teachers giving compliments. They want kids cheering. They want to have friend making and happy teachers and a happy principal and kids saying good morning and happy sounds. Now, if you've ever been in a classroom, I'm pretty sure you'd want all of those things. The kids are being very explicit about what they'd want to hear. Now, come back to doing the multi-sense stuff. Now, what do they want to feel more of? Excitement, happiness, surprise, hopeful safe, loved, proud of our school, proud of ourselves, happier uh, when we wake up before school, I love that one, people being nice, proud of each other, and proud of our teacher. Now I have to move my screen just a little bit because these other windows are covering this other piece. So uh, they, they, they want to do more uh, playing outside in good weather. I think pretty much all of us as adults want that as well. They want kind actions like helping others. You hear the pro-social behavior, there. friendliness, raising hands instead of calling out, not asking for things over and over again. I think every teacher, teacher and parent would agree with that. More PE, they're self-medicating because physical activity is good for them. More exercise, being on time, following directions, and having computer time. Now that's their vision of what they'd like to see, hear, feel, and do more of. Now we're gonna add something that's going to make this way, way more powerful. We're going to say, define this as PAX, and what they're creating, and what PAX means, it's a novel word to them, a neologism, and we're going to create a relational frame of deeper meaning that's purposeful. You're create with this vision, you're creating PAX, and that stands for peace, productivity, health, and happiness. So as the day goes by, we're going to be talking about what packs are we creating? What did we do that was more productive? What are we doing that's making us happier? What are we doing that's making us healthier? What are we doing that's making this more peaceful and happy? All of those things. Now you can begin to see, for my ACT friends, the building of a relational frame which increases the ability to generalize one's behavior based on purpose across people, places, times, and settings. This is one of the most powerful features of all of this, and it is completely driven by the children. Whoops. Now, um, I'm pretty sure everyone listening, as a child and as an adult, has been in situations that they would really like to see, hear, feel, and do less of whatever is occurring. So we're going to ask the children when we're doing this, what would in this most wonderful school, what would we see, hear, feel, and do less of? And you can see the list here. Okay, so less bullying, tantrum, threat, violence, fighting, people saying hateful words, nose on the bus, and contracts, force, spitting, restrictions, goofing around, and biting. 
Um, and I'm pretty sure most teachers want to see less of that. They want so, to. I mean, the point is that, that uh, of course, the list that the teacher would make would be much like the list that the students would make, but the students, the fact that it's the students' nominations is very important, right? Absolutely. And the, the funny thing is, without this framework, the teacher will, when you tell the teacher, well, the kids need to participate in the rule setting in a classroom, which is a typical prescription. However, what in that circumstance, the children only reflect back what they've heard adults say about rules. And it doesn't have this authenticity of the student voice. And if you look, David and, and my other folks that are online, so if you look at the list of feel less of, angry, pinching, punching, kicking, tired, bullied, hurt, loneliness, pushing, shoving, danger, sad, mad, shy, jealous, agitated, nervous, selfishness, guilty. In training with teachers, we asked, okay, look at that list. What does that list mean that they would like to feel less of? And inevitably, one teacher will raise his or her hand and say, oh, that means they're actually experiencing those things now. That's right. So here you have diagnostic uh, strategy as well. And then you can go on and see some of the other things, do less, name calling, fidgeting, and so on. Now, we likewise give, give these things a novel name. We call these not rules, not whatever. We call them spleens. Now, that's a neologism, and it has a purpose as a neologism. For, it doesn't have any emotional loading to it. And it allows the children to have a lightness about it. And what we tell them and the teachers is everyone spleams just like everyone poops. And you can win the PAX game if your team has three or fewer spleams. This is in service of detuning the adult reaction and child reaction to problematic behavior in the classroom because harsh or emotional reactions to problematic behaviors like this in the classroom actually increases them because you're increasing a fear response, anger response, and you're tapping into evolutionary human aggression responses. And so we're trying to uh, downregulate that. So there's one of many evolution connections. We haven't been using the E word, uh, the evolution word much, but there's one of uh, many evolutionary connections. Yes. Keep going. Yeah. And this will loop back to this vision that they're doing also is very closely aligned to some of the principles of Eleanor Ostrom and her common pool resource. This is having authentic voice uh, inside of this. And we're substantially increasing psychological flexibility and safety because what most teachers don't understand until they've done this exercise and experienced, rules are fixed, but spleams are contextual and now what we're teaching, we're building for children, is the ability to predict, monitor, and reflect on how they're navigating and driving in a purpose-driven world where they're trying to create something and they're working toward a goal individually and collectively. And this is so helpful. This is, when people say, can we change the words, we say, no. This is uh, just inherently part of it. Um, now, we, the game, people say, well, what is the game? Okay, now you're ready. So a classroom is divided into three to five teams. And it, those teams can be formal, they can be informal. So they could be formal, the kids can wear little wristbands that we have. Uh, they could also be informal, so the front, if the kids are sitting on the carpet, the first row, second row, third row, fourth row, there's four different teams. Uh, it could be in different stations. It could be if you're walking down the hall, one half of the line versus the other half of the line. So it's quite flexible, and you rotate teams all of the time, and you never put all of the bad kids, quote, unquote, uh, on one team. Otherwise, you have the sort of uh, Zimbardo prison experiment, and that doesn't end well. Um, and that also taps into other evolutionary science and behavioral science that when you put all the bad kids together, you actually dramatically increase the rate of problematic uh, behavior. Deviance training, they call it. Deviance training, yes, that's exactly. So we want PAX training, not deviance training. Um, now the kids are on teams, 
And so let's say David is the captain of uh, one team, I'm the captain of another team, and Ashley is another captain of the team, and I don't know who else is on here. So we've got five people on our team in our little class. And so we have the blue team, the red team, and the yellow team. So if you're a teacher, you don't call out an individual child for making a spleen. You only lightly notice the spleen for the team. Blue team, I heard a spleen. And then somebody else on one of the other teams makes a spleen. You know, oh, I saw a spleen over there on the yellow team. And often, soon after all of this has started up, the kids are moving a clothespin on a counter for their teams. There may be a scoreboard up on the wall. Teacher can have a portable scoreboard. All sorts of ways of making it easy to do throughout any routine of the day. And this, by the way, to break in, is while they're doing schoolwork. So this is not yes. by taking time out of schoolwork. This is while we're doing schoolwork. Yeah. Whatever it is, you're doing it. And so often... Let's, let's say the kids are doing a very intensive math lesson. So if they start flipping through their desk and looking, you know, just fidgeting with stuff, that would be a spleen. But now if they're doing paired reading or something like that, the natures of the spleens shift dramatically. If they're doing uh, some kind of cooperative learning project using manipulatives, the definition of spleens change. If they're sitting on the carpet just listening to a story, that's different. So it's always done during instructional school-related activities. It is not a lesson. It is something built in to help drive children toward the purpose that they set forward. Now, what happens when you do this? So we take regular data, and we have what we call PACS partners who are local coaches to help make this happen. And we do direct observation of children's behavior. So this is 3,000, let me have kids, I can't, I got the, 3,329 children across three school districts uh, in New Mexico. The governor's uh, office and cabinet commissioned us to do a study of a rapid rollout study of these three school districts, and it's about 275 teachers or so. And we started in uh, late March with these people, so we had only about uh, eight weeks, maybe ten weeks to do this. We had direct observers and what you, uh, counting spleens, and we count them very strictly according to a base, uh, well-established code. We typically get about 90% inter-observer reliability for my um, ABA-type folks on the line. Now, we're not doing 10-second interval coding or anything quite that precision because that's over the top. One-minute intervals are fine. So what you see here is in, for example, the Bloomfield School District, uh, on average, the uh, children had at least 26 disruptive, disturbing, or inattentive behaviors per student per hour. After the teachers then impl uh, learned and implemented PACS, uh, GBG, and all of it that it entails, we, it's down by 38%. Uh, Similarly, now it's a, the spleens are not quite as high per child in Espanola. There's an interesting aspect about that. The children are more traumatized there. So from lots of history of adverse uh, childhood experiences that are associated with the uh, suppression of uh, the Native Americans, et cetera, and the opiate trade and child maltreatment, et cetera. So, but still we see a 43% reduction in their problematic behaviors. And then over in Santa Fe, they had much higher rates per child, almost 34, 30, and now they're down, and it's again, it's a 38% reduction. So one of the purposes of PACS is to systematically reduce these problematic behaviors because if you have, the higher they are, the more behavioral contagion that you have for deviant behavior. That's our first anchor that we want to see happen, and that is limiting problematic behavior. Whoops. Okay, so all right, that's in one place. What if you do this across the United States? So this is eight Title I school districts across the United States, which uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration recruited. We have a little more precise data here because there was more funding for that. 
Uh, so we have baseline observations among 186 teachers. Then we have uh, observations after the students have learned the language of PACS and a kernel. So for example, a kernel, uh, the smallest unit of scientifically proven behavioral influence, we use a harmonica for transitions and a peace sign, and it's on a lanyard. And that's because most teachers yell, use a bell, um, clap their hands, etc. So if we go into a school district like we did the, a few weeks ago, and I clap my hands in a little routine, and I ask, what is that sound like? People look at me kind of, huh? Well, it's clapping. But if you do that in front of children, uh, as we did in one instance, the child, uh, one of the children, spontaneously and immediately spoke up and said, a slap. And uh, the room was filled with social workers, so there was like this collective gasp as they realized uh, that the clapping could be, in fact, re-traumatization for a lot of children. So we think deeply about a lot of these things, and of course, trauma exposure in children tends to evoke a lot of gene expression related to mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders that are not necessarily behavioral disorders or psychiatric disorders. We call them that, but they're in fact evolutionary adaptations to perceived threats, stress, and short life versus long life. So here we see, yeah. Yes, David. Yeah, just no, nice, nice connection. So. Uh, um, most of what's problematic is actually an adaptation in the evolutionary sense of the word. There's yes. nothing to prevent it from being uh, problematic. Yes. Um, so that, that's a big aha for a lot of teachers, actually. So now after we introduce the language, we introduce some of these uh, signals as they were, uh, you see about a 30, 40 percent reduction in the problematic behaviors. And then after, um, that's in the blue, and then if you look at the green, we've played the good behavior game now for one month in those classrooms. And now the observers went back in and observed the kids when not playing the game two to three times. And now what you see is about a 70 to 80% reduction in those problematic behaviors that are contagious. This is the key active ingredient, then, of evoking pro-social behavior and minimizing problematic behavior and toxic influences that might lead to adverse uh, child, further adverse childhood experiences, psychiatric or behavioral disorders, as well as adverse gene expression. And one of the things we know is the more you're exposed to problematic behaviors as a child, as a girl, for example, your probability of engaging in early sex and having er, uh, earlier menses is much higher. So how did this get generalized beyond the game? You just said that uh, those, those last measurements were, were taken when they weren't playing the game. That's an important step, right? So within the yep. game and just in general. So speak a little bit about that. Well, you're correct. And you can only play the game so much because it actually takes huge prefrontal cortex uh, involvement. And if you play the game too long, the kids just get exhausted mentally. So you play it three to four times, uh, five times a day. And uh, then you do other things to help generalization. Uh, so one of these is the Granny Swacky Prizes. So you see a few of these. It's based on the pre-MAC principle. We have about three to four hundred of those. So if the kids uh, were good, uh, playing the game, or they could have been good spontaneously and you reward them. So the top picture that you see there, the children sitting at the desk, uh, their prize randomly drawn, which makes it much more reinforcing, that causes what we call, that uh, releases anticipatory dopamine, which again is an evolutionary mechanism to get organisms to repeat behavior that have evolutionary significance. So they're sitting backwards on their chairs, which is normally prohibited, they get to do that for five or ten minutes. The other children in the bottom are, uh, you know, playing a game of, play, of playing dead, and the teacher is going around and trying to tickle them, graveyard, you know, tickle them with a feather and making them laugh. The kids adore that. The other kids up here are doing uh, essentially Simon Says to music, um, and again, this teaches behavioral momentum to teachers' instruction which is extremely important. 
The bottom one are tootles, which are peer-to-peer -peer positive or pro-social notes. So the students, I might say to um, Ashley, I'd write on her thing. Thank you, Ashley, for preparing everything for my webinar. It was the most successful webinar I've ever done. I've had lots of business orders, and people want to pay me millions of dollars to uh, give lectures across the world. That'd be nice. Um, and I sign it, Dennis, and give it to Ashley. Well, Ashley's going to you know, smile and be happy and probably repeat helpful behavior and pro-social behavior as a consequence. Toodle notes, they're technically called uh, positive peer-to-peer -peer notes in the scientific literature. We use the word toodles, it's cuter, and it, we teach the children it means the opposite of a tattle. So that's one of the way, and those toodle notes get used in amazing ways to create generalization when you're not playing the game. So for example, I might appoint a student to be a secret PAX tutor for me, and so I selected David, and um, I'll say that I have Tony Biglin in my classroom, and Tony Biglin is being a real snot, and I'm getting very frustrated with Tony. So I will tell David, I want you to look for Tony being a PAX leader, and I want you to write down what you saw him do that was PAX, and I want you to sign the tootle note, a secret PAX leader, and you give it to me, I'm going to look at it and make sure it's okay, and then I'm going to give it to Tony. And then Tony's going to look around the room and go, well, who's noticing me? So those are indiscriminable contingencies on the positive side. So that's an, these are examples of building in generalization when you're not playing the game. We have other tricks, too. I want to, I want to um, uh, actually, let's just keep on going. I'm going to save my own question for the Q&A, so please keep on going. Okay, so now you add in all you add in the game, you add in all of these kernels, and we know it reduces the problematic behavior. It increases time on task. But what does that do for mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders, which are typically evolved out of problematic peer context? So this is our Manitoba province-wide policy trial, and it's a randomized policy trial. So Virtually all of the first graders in Manitoba, except for two school districts, were randomly assigned to be in uh, PAX GBG in uh, one year or delayed to the following year. So eventually all of the children got it, but there was a year where they didn't. And so those children, about 5,000 kids, we have all of their health care data, we have all of their social services data, their birth histories, we even have their um, data from the census that we can correlate, so social economic characteristics and so on. And we used an instrument called the Strength and Difficulties Questionnaire filled out by the uh, teachers before and after. And this is a, called a latent class analysis. So what you see is moderately problem students, and the um, just for a background on the SDQ, it measures five domains of mental health, uh, fewer conduct problems, emotional problems, hyperactivity, peer problems, and pro-social skills. So what we see is our moderate level kids, they have some, they have clinical significance. In one semester, they move to low risk, and the probability is one out of a thousand. And we have our high problem kids who are well into the clinical range, moving to the moderate risk in one semester. And again, that is one out of a thousand probability. And then we have high problem kids um, moving to low risk. Uh, that's into the normative range. So now that is one in a hundred. So this is a huge positive finding. This is a public health finding that we could prevent potential lifetime psychiatric disorders in one semester from of these things. Um, I'll pause at that. Oops, sorry. Now, we also think we are reducing toxic influences. How do we know this? Well, one of my other studies, called the Peace Builder study, we actually measured 
nurses' office visits in the schools. And uh, that particular study is very interesting because the Centers for Disease Control was the official sponsor of our study. And for the first time in the history of Centers for Disease Control, many uh, people on the, on the webinar will know about uh, epi uh, teams that the CDC sends out. They're sending some of those out to states now for Zika. So this was the first time in the history of the CDC that they sent out an epi team to go through all of those schools' nurses' office records to investigate an outbreak of prevention and peace. And we were able to show that when you did these kinds of things, creating this positive pro-social uh, environment, that we reduced all forms of nurses' office visits and we actually reduced medically coded violent injuries among children at school, which I think is, is pretty exciting. So there we have direct uh, measures of uh, affecting uh, injury and violence. Now, Eleanor Ostrom, for some folks I know on the webinar will know who she is. She's the first woman yeah, well, to... Well, well, known well known to some of the EI folks. Yeah, to win a Nobel laureate in economic... Uh, economic sciences, and she wasn't even an economist, and by God, she was a woman from a, a Midwestern university. She wasn't even from one of the big universities in the world. But damn, she was smart and in investigating a really serious problem, which is how to organize what makes successful common pool resources, like water rights, fishing rights, mining rights. And you can also think of children's futures as a common pool resource. If our Kids don't do well right now. Uh, my Social Security and my Medicare are not going to be very good. And for those of you who are in your 40s, it will really suck. Um, that's a technical term. So what are her pr principles? So strong group identity, a sense of group purpose. Now, how do we achieve that in Pax GVG? Through that visioning process by the children becoming PAX leaders and addressing them as PAX leaders and asking them, well, what would a PAX leader do to solve that problem? There is their group identity now, but the group, they have teams and they rotate, but they're working for a larger purpose. Now there's proportional costs and benefits, but we're careful about that. So the kids aren't, you know, if the kid makes a spleen, they're not sent to the principal's office. Uh, if you spleen too much, your team doesn't win, but, you know, maybe in 30 minutes or an hour you get another chance to try. But everyone benefits with the cooperation, and uh, often the kids really, really like it when all of the teams win. Um, over and over again, the kids will go, everybody won, everybody won. Now, there's consensus decision making. So here again, you can see this process, but it's not just the kids. This, the t all the adults in the room are involved in making this work and they're brought into it so that it's both the children and the adults. And then the monitoring. So the teacher is counting the spleens, or the kids may be helping record them, and they're posting them. We also keep track of the number of win minutes won by the team, so they, they graph PACS minutes. So that's like the United Way thermometer of how much money that we've raised for the benefit of the community because the more PAX minutes you have in your classroom, the excellent data, that the better um, your academic achievement will be, uh, not only in the immediate term, but for the lifetime of the students. And there are sort of graduated uh, sanctions here. Um, if children, for example, if a child continues to spleen or what we call splams if they they've gotten over uh, three spleams for their team and they continue to spleen just to get attention they might have a spleen for the next time their team plays the game or if the child does that repeatedly they might need to play as a team of one and why we do that is they're not getting any, any attention from the other kids or the other uh, on their team or the classroom for their spleaming. And typically in two to four days, the kid is asking to be back on teams. We have fast and fair conflict resolution that is deeply vetted inside of this, and that's a much more extended uh, conversation about that um, because we have other resources to help make this work. 
Uh, then we have local autonomy. Who gets to decide how this operates, basically? The people in every classroom, in every school, in every school district, they have a formula like that is based on Ostrom's principles, but they get to infuse it, what prizes they like, where they're doing some of this, etc. And what we're trying to do is now, the last one is most um, difficult to explain to people, that there's kind of, this is uh, all the way down. So we work very closely, for example, with positive behavioral interventions and supports across the country. And so that's a bigger level of PACS GBG that we can infuse the same tools that then helps them at a whole school level. Did I cover that well enough? Yeah, that's great. Okay. So uh, this is playing a game. I'm not going to show the videos probably today because it gets cumbersome, but you can go online and see, but only look for videos that say PACS Good Behavior Game because sometimes you'll see people who've done a video for a student project in undergraduate or graduate school, and they don't really understand it. They just call it the Good Behavior Game, and it's a mess. So just the PACS Good Behavior Game. So you see here there's some wonderful ones um, in Hillsboro uh, School District and other places in across Ohio. So here, uh, this is Jade. Uh, she's a fifth grade teacher in um, a school in San Francisco Unified, which is now moving towards district-wide implementation of PACS GBG based on its results. And she will be, she's asking her kids to think about what would be PACS and SPLEAMS. They're going to be doing partnered instruction and differentiated instruction. She's grouping her children by some of their ability, so, and she's given them a general assignment, but by grouping them, she can then differentiate the instruction more tightly to their instructional needs. And the kids will be using a counter on their table. In this slide, you can't see it, but maybe I can put up another slide. So if she calls out the spleen uh, on the table tent, the kid will simply move the um, clothespin from one to the next. And if the kid forgot to do it, she will just walk by, oh, I forgot, and just move it and make no fuss. So she's able to move around the room. The kids predict here what packs and swings would be, and they do an excellent job of doing that. Uh, the game will last in this particular, you can see up there the timer is on the whiteboard. It's for 45 minutes. And um, at one point the timer will ring, and this is after some of the kids have stood up. They've also read the poems that they've written, and the kids are wonderfully attentive. They're very productive. Uh, the special ed director for the San Francisco Unified wasn't there that day, but on a previous day. And she walked away and said it was the best classroom visitation that she'd ever made in her life um, in San Francisco. And it, it's very touching to hear the students speak. I could, might play some of that. Um, when they spoke up, they talked about how important this was, how their classroom was not pleasant. Now they support each other because of PACs. They we, do want, we do need to uh, be mindful of time and leave time for the Q&A, but I would love to hear a little video clip. If you could just play a little something. Yeah, well, let's so see. Just to hear it from, from the students. Hang on just a minute. I have to put that up. Giving you just a very strange sort of screen here. Hang on a moment. And if anyone wants to start asking questions yeah. on the chat box, I think then uh, then uh, we can begin to get a little flavor as to what the uh, what the audience is curious about. Okay.
minutes ago. Hey, David, um, we've got somebody who's raised their hand. So her name is Lisa. Oh. Okay. Hello. There you go. Hey, this is Lisa Coyne. How are you guys? Hey, Lisa. Hello. How are you? Lovely to see you. So you are being joined by the McLean OCDI Junior. The um, it's the residential program for kids with severe anxiety and an OCD. We treat kids who are 10 to 17, and we are wondering if you have thoughts and data on how this was adapted or has been adapted in residential units? Uh, that is an excellent question. Yes, it can be and has been. So in Vermont, they've used it in a treatment facility. There are adaptations, uh, of course. You know, some spleams are not counted as spleams <laughs> until the child gets some, you know, competency. And there's pre-teaching and training of it. Uh, we also have this in place in a, the multi-million dollar therapeutic program for children in Manitoba called COACH. It's 24-7. Nice. And, um, and that, that it's a marvelous program. They asked us to introduce Pax GBG there, and I was like, well, you guys don't need it. You're wonderful. And they said, well, we want it in our facility because when our children are discharged from our facility back to normal classrooms, they, they fall apart. They can't handle that. So we'd like to do PACS in, at COACH and then put this on the IEP for the child in, when they're stepped down. So that, that they've been doing, but what was very interesting was, uh, much to my amazement and their pleasant happiness, PACS actually helped the children in COACH because uh, one of the differences, they really hadn't included the students as having as much active roles in you know, defining their treatment, which PACS kind of gives them window to do that. And yeah, this is like, I mean, this is like uh, violations of those core design principles that you don't really think about. You think you're the yeah. adult, you know what's best, you're going to create yeah. this great environment for the students, but actually you've broken a design principle there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and one of, the, one of our children, she's, um, oh my God, they, it, it was so awful they had to build her a special house to live in. That's another conversation. But after we started doing PACS, uh, then they realized, we told them, you know, student jobs are really important. We have a special paper we pu uh, published with Tony Volk and Bruce Ellis on that. Um, and so that girl, very, very smart, she essentially started doing all the travel expense reports for all the adults in the building, much to their major relief, and she did it much better than any adult. And they got paid sooner as a consequence. <laughs> so... Um, and she, uh, you know, it was just amazing to watch that. It's smaller teams. We also have this in place in a therapeutic environment where we have a lot of children with autism in the Dayton area. And if you'd like to come see that when we have our PACS partner training in the first week, the last uh, three days of the week of November, right, right after the day after the election, you might need medication. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, but, uh, we will have that on board, and it's uh, really lovely to That's see awesome. see the the kids. You know, it gives them back an authentic sense of purpose that they've not had before. We use a lot of social story type things. That was some of my original work with Sesame Street. So again, by making the children the heroes, letting them actually see how these things work and have control over them is huge. Nice. Okay, so uh, I have to play the role of timekeeper. That was great, Lisa. And, uh, so thank you so much. And, uh, and so uh, let's see this video, and then uh, I'm going to do a time check with you, Dennis, because I know there's so much to say. But at the same time, questions like Lisa's, and then Jerry Miller has asked a, text, a chat question I'm, I'm sure we're going to address in our, in our, in our talk. But let's see if we can see this video. I was looking for the... The kids, students. And if it's too difficult, I'm sorry that I suggested it. We can just move on. 
Yeah, I think we should move on because I, it, I, I should have queued that one up. I had heard Jade's video easily available, but not the kids. Okay. Uh, well, apologies for that delay then. Let's, see, let's continue then. And, uh, and actually, uh, let me just get uh, uh, Jerry's question out here, which is basically what happens, uh, the kind of the long-term effects, especially when kids move on to social environments, classrooms, and other social environments in which the GBG is not being played. So, yeah. um, and, and um, I know, and you're about to say, that this has lifelong benefits. Playing it for a single year has lifelong benefits. So, uh, but uh, go ahead, please. Yeah, we've got two major cohorts, and we have others in process right now of following children. Uh, so our first cohort and second cohort at Johns Hopkins are now approximately 30 and 35, respectively. That represents about 2,000 children in those studies. Uh, both studies are comparative effectiveness trials. So uh, one study involved um, Pax, what is now Pax GBG, and other and another condition was a kind of mastery learning process versus control. The other study, comparative effect in the study, was what is now Pax GBG versus nine sessions of 90 minutes each of parenting supports for every family in the first grade classroom versus control. Uh, what we see is um, the good behavior gain has very very large lifetime effects on reducing mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders uh, across the broad spectrum, including suicide. Uh, this is the only elementary school program that has so far been, and, and remember this is a public health approach, this isn't a uh, screening, referral, and treatment approach to re reduce actual suicide attempts and mortality, and it reduces criminal, uh, violent criminal offending, uh, et cetera. And with two years, improves the result more, but one year alone is significant. And it seems to flip a switch in the children's brains. Now, one of the things that we know why is uh, we have a mediation study on the reduction in suicide, and the mediation is that this changes peer relationships, and it is the positive change in peer relationships that mediates the major reduction in suicide attempts. And that makes quite a lot of sense uh, when you're wearing your clinical hat. Um, this is, let me play this. So one of the things to know is that, and this gets at that. So yeah. you're cr creating self-regulation, co-regulation with peers, and then group regulation. Because kids with mental health problems um, don't know how to co-regulate with other kids and don't know how to group regulate. And so their self-regulation just goes to in the toilet. So this is constantly uh, doing that, and that's what we see as the significant um, cause of that. And then we're creating this psychological flexibility and safety and resilience for my uh, folks in uh, ACT that they'll recognize so the kids have a sense of resiliency, okay, I screwed up on this one, but I can try again and I'll succeed, and problem solving things so they don't get mentally stuck. Now, what does this do long term? So we can estimate that uh, if, we, if we take the universe here as first graders. So we can take first graders, we have about four million first graders each year in the United States, and theoretically, based on the effect sizes and the long term studies, out of four million of those kids, if they got it, we'd expect about uh, 344,000 fewer young people to need any special ed. This would have a very large impact on uh, education costs. We spend about $79 billion each year on special ed. Uh, we've already seen reduction in referrals in most of our studies. We'd see about 22, uh, 222,000 more boys likely to graduate from high school, about 267,000 more boys likely to enter university. Uh, and this is all reflects in uh, reductions in historic uh, disparities for African American kids, et cetera. And 355,000 more girls likely to graduate from high school, and that's because they didn't get pregnant during, as teenagers. And 277,000 more girls likely to enter university, 38,000 fewer young people likely to commit and be convicted of serious violent crimes. That's really a pricey cost that is averted there not only in social costs, 
but just in human lives. And about 380,000 fewer young people would develop serious drug addictions, and one of the drug addictions that is clearly affected is opiate addictions, which is a major national concern. And about 263,000 fewer would become regular smokers from a health consequences. That is a huge savings there. Uh, and about 141,000 fewer young people will develop serious alcohol addictions, which will then have the impact on, on domestic violence, fetal alcohol effects, etc. And then you can see the suicide uh, effects. About 194,000 fewer young women will contemplate suicide, and 263,000 fewer young men will likely attempt suicide. So, and this, uh, the Washington State Institute for Public Policy has done all of these economic analysis, and they would show that by about 19 or 21, that this would save about $52 billion, and a good half of that is that the kids make more money personally from employment income um, in their lifetime. So, those are some of the long-term outcomes. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. So actually, I want to sneak in and, uh, and um, um, uh, this um, a question about practices that work but don't spread. Uh, what you're seeing now at this stage, bearing in mind that the game was invented in the 1960s, uh, now it seems to be spreading quite rapidly, although you might wish it to be more rapid still. Uh, yet that took decades in the making. And uh, so uh, speak a little bit uh, to the this paradox of, you know, uh, I mean, the idea that this had something like an 80 to 1 benefit-cost ratio has been known for a long time, and yet yeah. it did not spread by wildfire, like wildfire. So speak a little bit about that, and then, and then let me know what else you really want to get out there before we go to our Q&A, because I really do want to leave uh, what's now going to be about half an hour for our Q&A, if at all possible. So, uh, so uh, speak to my point, and then, and then let's, um, let's go on from there. Well... Part of it is selection by consequences for researchers. Researchers don't earn brownie points for promotion and tenure in making behaviorally based or psychological based practices into commercial products. Professors do get selection by consequences for making electronic things. Uh, into money-making enterprises because most of those are patented and then the university gets money. Here we're talking about copyrighted materials which typically revert to the uh, person who invented them. Um, and that's one thing. So they're the operative financial contingencies and reinforcers are not there for many of these researchers. I'm one of the few researchers who's taken like multiple things to national and international scale. But I'm a for-profit business. I'm not a university academic, um, and so I have more degrees of freedom uh, to operate, recruit investment money, uh, take risks, um, et cetera. So that's one uh, issue. The other thing is the way we fund behavioral science is not actually focused on taking it to commercial enterprise as the way we fund pharmaceutical things. So when you move, when you devise something that is a pharmaceutical that's going to work, you first do the smaller scale studies. I'll call them efficacy studies, and then you start moving to real world uh, trials to see that they could be scaled up and reduce the uh, potential adverse effects, etc. So in prevention science, in most of behavioral science, the only way people are funded as scientists is they have to propose yet another study to find out, well, what might be the one active ingredient that lives inside of PAX-GBG that makes it work? My argument is uh, that creates um, incentive, perverse inf uh, incentive structure, we should be talking also about this as public health or prevention science engineering so that we could bring these things to scale. And you really don't want to study, you, you know, if you get in a car, I have an electric automobile and my husband has an electric automobile. I really don't, and I get on airplanes a lot. And when I get on an airplane, I really don't want to know the one screw or bolt that's holding it up in the air. I want to be assured that there are many ways 
many redundancies that are keeping this airplane uh, in the air, and if something goes wrong, there are redundancies for those redundancies. So prevention science and public health models for uh, change have to have different incentive structures uh, to do this. That's number one. Okay, great. Well, uh, now you're in the driver's seat here, my friend. So, uh, okay. so um, now we have half an hour left, and we want to leave room for Q and A. Uh, what would you like to okay. do? do you have points that you well, want to make? If, there's, let's, if there are some questions, let's take that presently so that we don't lose that uh, thing, and then I'll talk further about the sort of vision of how to take these kind of science larger. Okay, yeah, so if anyone wants to raise their hand. We have a few questions that came in while you all were talking. Um, so right. Joe Brewer, he has a question that's actually twofold. Um, he says that as he's been listening um, to this excellent discussion, he couldn't help but think about social media and our dysfunctional political discourse. So the first part of his question, is how might these tools be brought into blogs, Facebook, et cetera, to help cultivate the pro-social norms you've described? Mm -hmm. And the second part of the question, unless you want to go with that first part. The, give the second part so I can understand the sequence. How might the lack of emotional maturity and social skills among social media users be attributed to the absence of the kind of training of people earlier in life? Well, to answer the second question, a lot. <laughs> Almost certainly, we're raising a nation of uh, folks with autism spectrum disorder with antisocial personality characteristics. That's my clinical diagnosis. <laughs> um, so yes, I believe that we could spread this as the fundamentals of this as a technology. So essentially, people who um, use awful statements might accrue spleens, okay? And if you are, and if people are voting that, so right now you can only, you know, go like and so on, and the more outrageous, the more likes you get. But I think it's, if people could, if we could been to define better in community thoughtful things, and then if, you know, people are ranting and raising and calling names, that's a spleen. And let people know that because then you can begin to judge more and have greater trust in uh, those things. And that builds reputation. Reputation in Ostrom's principles are very good. And I think that would be lovely to have an extended conversation of taking Ostrom's principles, what we've learned in the Pax Good Behavior game, with some people who are in the Silicon Valley and say, um, we need to redo this, and right now they're inventing things that often uh, they look slick, but uh, they have actually adverse effects because they really haven't studied uh, behavioral theory. And one one example is there's a thing called Class Dojo, which was the result of a bunch of uh, Silicon Valley people saying, well, we need to do something to improve education, so they created what we call a clip chart. So if you have your children in your classroom, and uh, let's say um, we all of us have little icons or little um, characters that we can see, and they're mythical types of characters, so they're kind of cute. But so David makes a spleen. He says, you're full of it. So the teacher clicks her cell phone or computer, and he, his color for his uh, icon goes red or orange or whatever. So this is an old-fashioned thing, and uh, if he does that badly, his parents are notified immediately by text or email that he was bad. <laughs> now, for those of you who work with families who abuse their children or neglect their children, quite unfortunately, we have excellent uh, findings that when you do that for children who have difficulties and their families have difficulties, you increase the probability of mild treatment quite quickly. You also, for all the children who have anxiety disorder, have just made their day hell. And there's no <laughs> escape. You can't get it to move down. 
So these people can create these beautiful things, but there's, by the way, there's not a single scientific experiment published in the literature that I can find for flip charts that shows them that work. Uh, but, you know, it's flashy, cute, and that app cost well over $2 million to create. So we could do it. But uh, could it be done right? There's the technology, and then there's the science behind the technology. Knowing what you know, uh, could you use the technology and do something better? I believe so. I mean, it would be an iterative process. You know, so you're going to have to try it, look for the results, and um, and create a different feedback system. Right now. Um, and we might want to look at a, at a you know at a few things, but uh, so quickly. At, well, the other issue is that we know from the brain science literature that punishing people releases dopamine in the human that punished the person. So you can see why we have a sort of uh, epidemic, syphilitic epidemic of people uh, abusing other people in their comment sections and flaming on websites. They're getting a big hit of dopamine when they do that. See, I did that. I punished that dude. This is foundational to what happened in the prisons, and the you know, Stanford prison thing, uh, and what we saw in Afghanistan as well right. and Iraq. Right. So yes, I think it's possible. Good. It's, okay. If anybody knows anybody with some money to do this, that'd be good, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so why don't you continue and uh, Ashley, let us know if there's uh, any more uh, people raising their hands. And uh, until then, uh, Dennis, please continue. Yeah. We okay, actually, so. we have a few more questions that have come in. We right. have three actually. Okay. Um. And so then. Next one would be from Tina Hudson. Um, she was actually uh -huh. one of the teachers that did the quick launch in Bloomfield. Oh, okay. my gosh. <laughs> uh, she teaches sixth grade, and she is having trouble with getting some of her students to buy into it because they're too cool. So how do you get around that with older kids? Um... You have to be very sneaky. So you have to give them roles for helping run it. So we have another paper about that. Now, what when we did the rollout in New Mexico, and we didn't realize that there were going to be as many people in the upper grades coming to it. Um, as there were, and there's a bit of differentiated instruction that needs to happen for you. So I'm also going to uh, suggest that you give our office a call, and we'll help you out with that. But the more you give the kids uh, meaningful roles for helping implement it, then the better it goes down. So the trick is to disguise y your perceived authority, make help them come up, with other uh, prizes and so on. And remember that their uh, dissing it is in service of not defiance per se, but it's about getting peer attention. So you have to manipulate how they get peer attention. So one of the ways that you could also do that is so pick out your number one troublemaker. And one of the things that you might do is uh, so you spontaneously announce that you've had a mystery player and that Billy Badass, who comes from a long line of them, uh, has just been a mystery packs player and he's done really great packs and he's won for the whole class. And he, you get, he gets to pick a prize from the Granny Swacky Prize jar for the whole class. And you might make up something that was topographically similar to something that he does that's slightly disruptive. So that's called the pre principle. And so now 
you, he, you've used the very thing um, that he kind of causes disruption as the reinforcer, but you've done it under his con your control, uh, and you're reinforcing him or her now for pro-social behavior. Does that help much? And we certainly invite you to give us a call. Well, uh, let me add something to that, and it also um, addresses mm -hmm. Joe Brewer's, uh, one of Joe Brewer's uh, uh, comments. You've already uh, related the good behavior game to the Ostrom design principle. And the yeah. Ostrom design principles obviously apply to adult groups. That's where they were derived, groups of adults managing their common resources. So when we think of all of these as social groups of one sort or another, and when we see that the same principles are needed for adult groups as for uh, groups of children plus everything in between, then it's clear that if we focus on sixth graders or something, then uh, there's something can be made to work. Uh, the vocabulary might have to be different. Actually, and, uh, it doesn't. Uh, it really? Well, you must tell yeah, me, surely, surely uh, children outgrow Granny's wacky prizes and spleens and, and so on at some point. Is that not the case? Well, you might, you might not call them Granny's, but they're wacky prizes. One of the things you need to remember in sixth grade, neural pruning happens. So the children actually are now more reward dependent. They need more reinforcement and they are highly much more impulsive. In fact, when I'm wearing my developmental psychologist hat, we say there are basically two toddlerhoods, one at three and one at 13. The problem with the 13 year olds, they're just bigger and meaner um, and their tantrums can go on for longer times. So what you notice, so for example, we have an, a video of an eighth grade classroom from absolute hell in Baltimore, out of control for seven months. So one of our uh, PACS partner trainers uh, in the Hopkins projects went into that classroom and the young man who was the teacher, very, very well intended, he'd grown up in that neighborhood, he wanted to give back to his school and community. Um, so she started out, and I, when I first saw the video, I thought, oh my God, she's like four foot three and she's a New York Jewish girl and the African American girls are like giant from the uh, steroids from the stress and the boys are either hugely muscular or miniature. So it was uh, from the stress hormones. So it was like, oh my God, I think I'm going to watch death. Here. <laughs> so she, it was rugged. And you have to play shorter games with some of those older kids because they are less competent than fourth and fifth graders in maintaining attention and focus. And so she played a one minute game and they won by the skin of their teeth. Um, and she carefully noticed what they were doing. So uh, when she drew randomly, I thought either God, some other mystical source was protecting her or she knew what to do and she cheated and she did it properly. Uh, I'll get to that, answer that question. But the prize she announced to them was a primal screen, which was perfect because that's exactly what they had been doing. So she gave them, uh, I think, three seconds to do the primal screen, and they stopped, and then she asked them, would you like to play the game again? And I suspect you would recognize exactly what they said. They practically screamed at the top of their lungs, yes. Then, so that was a three minute game. Then they started to pick up their, you know, she, they reviewed what packs and Flames were. They started to pick up their papers and work on those papers. The noise level fell to purposeful noise and they won the game. So it's, there's trickiness in this. In order to have to notice the children, this is being a huge principle in this, is being a good everyday scientist. So if whatever behaviors that they're doing, figure out a way to make those into a wacky prize. 
Uh, Ashley, do you have some more questions? Uh, yep. So the next one comes from Tara, and she would like to discuss the long-term effects of reduction of MEVs. Um, why are they less robust for females? Well, uh, there's a couple interesting questions about that. So one of the things that has happened is girls have been contaminated by the masculine culture in a way. So they have become more externalizing over time. So now we're seeing our newer studies show there is greater, if you want to call it that, equity in reducing some of these externalizing disorders, both in boys and girls. So now there's still higher prevalence rates in boys than girls. Now, we also realize that there need to be some, and we have added some things to this to improve the greater generalization of this. And this is an ongoing research project where we're trying new things to incrementally improve the outcomes. So if you have thoughts about something that we might add in this context that would further uh, that generalized ability of benefits to both boys and girls, we're all, all for to hear that. But there has been some major social changes since this was first implemented in the late 80s in terms of rise of externalizing disorders among girls as well now. So there's a greater equity. I mean, sure a, general I like point to make, a general point to make, and I know from my previous conversations with you, uh, Dennis, that if you have a class of well-behaved children, then they need the good behavior game less than a highly disruptive class. And yes. so uh, and so probably there's an average difference between girls and boys and how disruptive they are. And so yeah. that means that the that the marginal increase is going to be less than for girls than for boys simply because they're already a little better behaved. And I think that's actually quite commensurate with what you just said. Yeah. The other thing that we are looking at now is anxiety disorders have become epidemic uh, in America. And I cut my teeth on externalizing disorders in grad school and most of my career. And we weren't paying as much attention to anxiety disorders. So now that one third of our children will have an anxiety disorder by age 18, we're now looking at that and going, what can we infuse in Pax GBG that further addresses anxiety disorders? So stay tuned, we've got some things Coming, it just hasn't received as much research because teachers didn't refer kids as much. It tends to show up in drug use and suicidality in adolescents. Okay. okay, so we've got two more questions, unless anybody wants to sneak one in. Um, Anne would like to know, um, do you have suggestions for successful spread um, given the limitations that you discussed earlier? Well, um, let me add to that. Let me add to that. There are these big programmatic spreads, you know, entire school districts, for example, doing it. But what about a teacher that wanted to do it just in their own class? So that kind of spread. So uh, this is, you know, like I said, there's no, unless you know some really rich people that could help me with some development projects. Um, it's difficult to test everything, and we don't disseminate anything that we do not feel that we have evidence to do, and we have continuous improvement models. Now, what we, a couple of things that we've learned. We are now able, our Manitoba study was done with a two-day training, two trainers, uh, and about 150 people in the room at a time. That's quite remarkable, and we also did not have uh, what tax coaches or partners, as we call them, because we couldn't do that with equity throughout the entirety of the province of Manitoba. Uh, but we still had effects. So here's what we're, we have now a study, one study that shows that we can get effects from an online trial so that individual teachers can be brought on board. We're 
are want to replicate that with better technology in a more real world way because that was a hot house study. Now we need to replicate that in more real world conditions. But we are also getting ready. I actually just wrote have authorized the project. We were creating all sorts of additional videos so that all of our our local people could bring more teachers on on a smaller scale. The other thing that you can do in many locations that we've had is people have, like education service districts, departments of health, have brought together a centralized event where onesies and twosies can come and learn about the game and then go back and do it. And then that creates a kind of uh, contagion. People start seeing these kids being better and we call that the uh, mechanism of dissemination of when Harry met Sally. Whatever she ordered, I want some of that. So that's one way we want to test our online training. We are just moving forward to also integrate this in the healthcare delivery system. So we have several projects across uh, the country where mental health licensed mental health professionals, instead of seeing children with externalizing disorders in their classrooms or in the, the office, which doesn't really do much to change the behavior, we're now going to be delivering Pax GBG in the kid's classroom and pre-teaching that child so that they will be successful. And if you're a licensed clinician, you can then bill for the implementation and services uh, to do that. So. What we want to do is to create a whole bunch of meaningful ways that uh, this could spread rapidly. Awesome. Okay, yeah, Ashley, is there one more? Yep, we've got one more. Um, I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. I believe it's Tanya. Um, she, uh, how do you distinguish if a school requires good behavior game versus other positive reinforcement strategies? And is the good behavior game contextualized to a setting if viewed appropriate? So an example would be the use of indigenous cultural language, things like that. Well, uh, to answer the second question first, it is inherently driven by the culture of the users. So if you do this practice uh, on res on in First Nations or Metis or Native American uh, tribes here in the United States, it will be driven by their context. So everything that gets put up on that vision chart, the nature of the prizes, the way people talk about it, or the nature of the tootle notes, all of those things are driven by the culture, whether it be um, just almost anything. That's the inherent beauty of it. It is not a curriculum. It's a process thing driven by these universal principles of Ostrom. So, and to give you an idea of how powerful that is, uh, the Swampy Creek Confederation in Manitoba asked for and submitted a grant to the Canadian Institutes for Health Research to infuse Pax GBG not just in their classrooms, but in everything every manner of way in their community. Now, the white middle class reviewers on the CHIR review board objected to this dramatically and saying, well, this all should be changed, uh, the naming and everything, and the, you know, the First Nations people should be, you know, they should design it from scratch. So the chief of the confederation wrote them a note back and said, shut up, basically because we've been doing this for a while and we deem this to be us. What we want is not a change in the classroom. We want to spread all these kernels and ideas throughout our entire community. That's what we have decided as a people. Um, so it's very interesting sometimes when the people speak, uh, the main core culture doesn't hear what the people are actually saying. So we're always very flexible what they talk about and how they do that. And I think that's why we have gotten such amazing reaction from indigenous peoples uh, throughout Canada and the U.S. Awesome. Great. Okay. 
Well, we have five more minutes. We, and, we um, have two more questions that just snuck in. If you okay. want. Okay, I, 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 I claim the last minute, so uh, okay. it's our, our fire. So uh, Priscilla would like to know if you have presence or training opportunities in the Australia, New Zealand region. Uh, good day, mates. I am a key, almost a Kiwi. <laughs> I lived for four years in, uh, uh, in New Zealand, and I've done a lot of work in uh, Australia. And yes, we are talking to four different groups about bringing this to Australia. And if you're interested, shoot us an email about that. And I've only had a little bit of talk with the Kiwis. So if you're a Kiwi or have Kiwi connections, please shoot me an email at dde delta delta echo at paxis.org. No, we'll provide the email. We'll yeah. the email. Okay. And uh, so we would love to do that. And by the way, looping back to culture, the way we are producing the manuals now, the Republic of Ireland is moving toward national implementation. And they asked us if we could have, if they could have a customized uh, manual and materials. And because we've moved to digital processing, this is no problem. So, uh, and we're very, very excited about this that we can personalize. Um, the practice to a given culture as they want it. And the marginal cost of doing that is not great. Awesome. Okay, Ashley. And last question. Um, Carolina uh, would like to know, are you aware of any research in relation to how physical environment contributes to the game or in general to the evolutionary educational theory? And does the built environment of schools contribute to the game? The built environment of the school can either facilitate the game or worsen the outcomes. Uh, I'm very much aware of the built environment and the natural environment of ecological effects. And we work strenuously to try to address those as best we can. That often requires uh, site consultations and visit to make that happen but we're very much aware of that. Can you give an example of how the physical uh, environment can inhibit the good behavior game? Uh, yes, for example, uh, it is common for people to restrict, ch uh, to put all the children at one time in the lunchroom. <laughs> um, the level of noise is so high that it actually induces what we call adustically induced uh, ADHD, um, and that's well documented in the literature. We also, if there's not enough physical activity, we want to make sure that the uh, large number of the prizes are simple prizes that create rapid physical activity in a short period of time, because again, there's good evidence uh, that that can make a difference. We're also very mindful of what's in the school lunch program. That's a much longer story. Uh, we do, I'm very much involved in some research with the National Institutes of Health on that issue and with our US military on those issues. So those are some examples. Oh, and we do give, uh, one of the things is recipes for the playground because the children no longer know how to play. So we have a whole library of games that fit into playing out on the playground to, because there is good evidence that that also makes a difference. Okay, so, uh, so good. So uh, thank you, Dennis. Thank you, uh, all who tuned in. I'm so happy this will be made available to a much larger audience uh, as a uh, recording. And as exciting as this has been uh, for the topic of education, uh, it's more exciting still to note that these principles apply to so many other contexts. Um, adult context, adolescent context, uh, and so the Evolution Institute sometimes confuses people because we do so much. Uh, but it's for that reason is that these principles are so applicable across uh, domains. So uh, thanks to all, and uh, we'll see you next time uh, at another um, uh, Evolution Institute uh, webinar. David and all, thank you very much for this opportunity.